certainly in my career, I've never, never seen anything quite like this. The land of Arcadia. Hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcade Economics. As we bring you the nightly silver news, we'll talk about some gold as well. But certainly if you're out there and you wonder sometimes, gee, it seems like these governments spend a lot of money, debt loads, monetary burdens go up never seem to come down, nobody on Wall Street notices. Well, you're in the right place. And fortunately, we're gonna cover all of that. Some responses uh, of which I turn to gold and silver. And as we begin, I'd like to just note real quick that tonight's episode is sponsored by Blue Lagoon Resources. That is out looking and digging up gold and silver. Um, Rana Vake, who runs Blue Lagoon, was on the show a couple months ago. Interesting guy, very accomplished entrepreneur that I was quite impressed by. And we will take a look at some of their news later on in tonight's show. Actually, a bunch of mining stock news that we will cover tonight. Although we will start, of course, with the silver market. A very quiet day today on Tuesday. You see here the red line, that's the end of Monday night. So Tuesday, aside from this one spike up and then down, uh, pretty flat, which, you know, is all well and good. I find intriguing just in the context of here you see the open on Sunday night. There is silver and then just drops off a cliff. A lot of people woke up not in the best mood on Monday morning. Saw the price almost 2.5% lower and then quite an enormous spike up. And I was thinking about it. It's been 11 years now that I've been covering silver I don't know that I've ever seen a chart quite like this. You know, I try not to read into the charts because I don't have access to the trading records. I don't know who sold there or who bought there. Although I do have some evidence that at least gives us a few clues of what conceivably might be going on. If you're a regular longtime listener of the show, you may have heard some of these before. Um, but certainly if you're new to gold and silver and I think there's a lot of people have entered the space this year with what's going on with COVID and just more money printing than ever. Um, so if you're uh, hearing some of this for the first time, hopefully that'll put some context because again, and, and I don't just say this as someone who's, you know, like sitting in my basement watching YouTube. I left uh, the trading floor. I was trading equity options back on Wall Street, studying the gold and silver market during the day. And certainly in my career, I've never, never seen anything quite like this, of course. Well, actually, maybe we have seen, maybe again, for, for anyone out there saying, how come you always talk about silver? All the other markets are red too. Yes, I get it. Pretty smart ass, uh, fictitious smart ass out there that I talk to. These are like the critics I hear in my head. They're like, oh, you know, and I get the emails and... I know there's, there's, there's people even now that J.P. Morgan's paid $920 million or talking about what conspiracy theory it is that the markets could be manipulated. Although, um, I guess whether it's manipulated, suppressed, there's often seems to be debate around that. My core thesis is that at least when people are thinking of silver, this tangible object commodity that people can buy the physical units of, and I think people are trading and buying, uh, certainly the silver mining companies are heavily indexed to the silver price and people are buying assets that they think are gonna respond based on what they hear people doing with physical silver. And usually that's not the case because we see the silver price routinely clobbered while again, uh, I bring Andy Sheckman of Miles Frank on each week. I love uh, the episode a week or two ago where he talked about he had 231 orders in a week. There were four sellers. So anyway, to see, I, I would just say that these moves do not track what is happening in the physical silver market, which now to be fair, is there probably some legal phrasing somewhere declaring that COMEX futures don't have to do that? I have no doubt there is, but to the degree that a lot of people are thinking about what would affect the supply and demand of silver and then looking at these charts and getting a little bit confused. 
and I'm going to tell you why, <laughs> because fortunately I have some weird hobbies. I don't know. I was sitting around the trading floor. I was getting pretty bored um, because not all that much was happening on the New York Stock Exchange and especially seeing how there were certain people who had seen the housing bubble in advance and they were all talking about gold and silver. So I kind of had my trading job on autopilot. So I'd read Austrian economics, look at silver. And basically what I found is that usually when you have these big moves, it's accompanied with a large size order. Now what's interesting here, often we see big spikes of volume when the price goes down. And for people who say, responding to my critics again. Oh, well, they could manipulate it upwards. Okay, fine. Well, there would be a case. I don't know if that's manipulation or what it is, but maybe a way of phrasing it is that the way things trade in these COMEX futures markets is just there's large volume that can move the price in either direction. Now, I'm not trying to tell anybody else what to do. Basically, everything I earn, I put into silver or silver-related assets of some form. Um, I think in net, if you look at everything that's happened over decades, uh, probably even longer, uh, it was interesting in Doug Casey's book, Crisis Investing, he writes about even back in the, all throughout the 20th century, the different ways the government was manipulating the silver market with different price fixing schemes. Then you have LBJ take the coin, the silver out of the coins. So it's never been really a true supply and demand market, but in either case, um, certainly not the case now. And something that I would be curious about, and it's interesting, I'm actually pre finally preparing my CFTC whistleblower application. Now I'm not sure exactly what the criteria is I'm finding out, although, Really, the the main premise behind all of this was to help explain, because I think there's a lot of people who saw quantitative easing, saw a lot of money printing, saw debt loads that never get smaller, especially back in 2010, 2011, bought gold and silver in response. And I would argue you made the right trade, um, yet because things like this happen, again, the, the famous ones back in 2011 where the prices dropped yet, maybe after the prices dropped and interest was just destroyed, then affected the demand. But I don't think that was natural. And here's something, I've played parts of this before, but we're gonna take a little snippet of Bart Chilton, former CFTC commissioner, who presided over one of- With Fundrise, the real estate- Agency had a couple investigations into silver manipulation. Now they said that no evidence was found Although, as Bart Chilton mentioned to me here, there was plenty of evidence found. Of course, there's no dispute now because we had the Department of Justice just get the $920 million fine. And anyway, I'm gonna play a second of what Bart says here because uh, interesting point he makes. Handle so often if the price can get pushed a little bit, then you get a lot of those high frequency algorithms kicking in and then you'll see a drop with many feeling that people kind of nudging a little are then able to buy lower. Does that- And if I may pause there for a moment, that was really what I wanted to highlight, what I asked him there that, and that's what Ted Butler has reported for years, that the same people that are trading and selling here end up being the ones that buy back here. And Ted extrapolates from his analysis of those COT reports that not most of the time, but 100% of the time. Um, and, you know, it's, we'll see, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll see what Bart says here. Sound like a reasonably accurate portrayal to put it in perspective to folks or would you, Phrase it differently. Well, it's a, it's a good portray it's a good portrayal, but it's actually it's a very good portrayal. So he talks a bit more about that there, but again, I wonder if the CFTC has looked at that. If there's anything unusual, it just seems like an odd chart to me. And fortunately, while uh, 
I don't know if we'll hear from the CFTC. Ted Butler, I did talk with him today. Good news. I asked him if he wanted to come on and give a forecast for 2021. And the uh, schedule is a little booked out. and suggested in about two weeks. And he said, sure, although do we want to do it sooner? Because it looks like things are starting to get wild. So um, we'll see when I'll get Ted on as soon as possible. We'll fit him in there somewhere. But anyway, it seems like he's seeing some interesting things out there. Certainly, uh, I mean, when you look at the things that are happening in the world, it's almost hard to believe silver has not moved more already. But anyway, back one last data point on uh, the manipulation here. This is that famous uh, exchange between Andrew McGuire, who will be on the show tomorrow night, I might add, where he contacted the CFTC back in 2010 warning them of the manipulation and here's an interesting paragraph um if you look at the trades just before the pit open today you'll see around 1500 contracts sell all at once where the bids were tiny by comparison in fives and tens this has the immediate effect of gaining 2500 per contract on short positions against long holders lost that in moments and were likely stopped out glad that was mentioned because Again, keep in mind, these banks also, they're theoretically trading on behalf of their customers, so they do know where the stop orders are. My personal belief, I don't know if I can factually support this, but I'm guessing there's someone at most of these big banks that sits there and knows everything that the guys reading the charts are looking at and is gaming that. I believe Bart confirmed that somewhere in there as well. Um, and then Andrew says, perhaps look for yourselves into who was behind the trades at that time. Note that within the 10 minute period, 20 contracts hit all the bids to overcome them. This is hardly how a normal trader gets best price when selling a commodity. Uh, note silver instigated a rapid move lower in both precious metals. I would confirm what he's saying here. This is hardly how a normal trader gets best price. Uh, I feel quite confident in saying I was trained by a very well-renowned uh, options shop and we were specific i would have i imagine i would have been thrown out that afternoon if i did essentially what you see happen repeatedly here um and then again mentions here one of the scenarios if the news is bad this will have a bullish effect on gold as a dollar weekends precious metals draw bids spiking them higher this will be sold into within a very short time frame so something I've heard him talk about before, at least feel he's mentioned, is, is often, and you see this sometimes on those Fed announcements where even though it, it'll get spiked down, but it'll, it'll go up first. So they let some people up there buying and then who essentially are probably making a valid trade yet because you can overwhelm it with paper volume and sell as much paper gold and silver as you want then you get these counterintuitive moves. So that's been the emphasis behind this show, behind the book, The Big Silver Short, um, which a great Christmas present, I might add, for your friends. You can get copies, send them over to the CFTC and say, uh, you found this helpful. I've tried to warn people about what I saw going on there. And um, sure enough, we have some banks getting fined. Anyway, on to some other stories here. We have uh, a few interesting notes. It, the, here's the silver ETF holdings. You see it's been a little bit mixed over the past two months. This, this chunk here was pretty historic. Been a couple big weeks, a couple decent sized outflows in silver and in gold. You see a uh, last four weeks, a uh, decent amount of gold coming out of the GLD and the other ETFs, which I'm not entirely surprised by with the price lower. Any of that mania effect seems to have worn off. But in either case, we will be tracking this for you on a weekly basis. So another reason to hit that subscription button and the notification bell, because even better than that, the type of thing that you get here, Arcadia, includes a silver forecast for 2021 by Jorge Ramiro Monroy of Reina Silver. Jorge, uh, it's been great having you on the show a couple times this year. And as we round out 2020, amazingly enough, it'd be great to check in. I'd uh, love to see what you're expecting in the silver market going forward for 2021. 
Well, thank you, Chris. Great to see you again. And, and I mean, what a great year it has been for Silver so far. Um, you know, it's been great to, to as you said, come in your show a, a couple of times. It's been a great uh, year for us as we, as we took our company, uh, Reina Silver Public, in June of this year. Uh, sort of perfect timing, you know, with silver prices uh, being quite strong for most of the year. And I think the prospect for 2021 is, is looking quite good. Yeah, I mean, we've had the election this year. Now I'm seeing articles about Joe Biden planning to print a lot of money, which I guess they didn't need articles to come out to expect that. Around uh, close to $25 almost. We've seen yeah. a lot of volatile trading. And at the end of the day, well, I guess, I don't know the day or the timeline, but it just seems when you look at what's happening in the world that at some point, at some level, the, these guys are going to, I think they're actually going to print until they blow out these currencies for good. I don't, I don't think there's a, a step back plan. Yeah, well, listen, Chris, I, I, think, I think you're right. And I think, uh, you know, looking into 2021, the thing that, that really strikes me is the fact that just so many forces are just moving in favor of silver now. And you have uh, such a favorable market in, in many respects. You, you know, you've spoken to, uh, in great length in your channel a lot, a lot about the monetary policy that's, I think, very favorable for silver. I think, I think th th this is the way, this is my take on what silver will look like in 2021. I think you're gonna have a, a lot of volatility that comes from people thinking, you know, the vaccine is coming and, and you know, we're gonna go with the world back to normal. And then every time that that volatility will hit silver, prices, uh, you know, downward, but then as, as the reality sets in, you know, through the course of, of, of the year, I, I just don't see anything that can um, affect silver in a negative uh, way long term, because, you know, the, the reality is like you've been listening to, to the vaccine numbers and the plans of deploying it, and, you know, when you think it through, I don't think it's going to be that straightforward. I don't think uh, there, there's a lot of uh, flaws in, in the process of distributing it uh, in, in the effic efficacy, efficacy, and then, you know, are people really gonna take it or not? And then on the background of that, the damage that has been caused to the economy, not just of the US, but of the entire world as a result of the measures to, to stop the spread of COVID are just so significant. You know, the, the money printing that the U.S. did, absolutely unprecedented. Um, also, I mean, and I don't know to what extent your listeners are tracking what's happening in, in other countries, but, you know, the, the amount of, of debt, the amount of damage to the economies that, that's, that's happening, it's, it's, it's pretty significant. So I think, you know, we're looking at a situation where I think for a number of years now, we're going to have, you know, debt, currency debasement, we're going to have, um, in some cases, deflation. In some cases, we might, we might see inflation. I think uh, all those first forces are going to come uh, to support silver. And then another, you know, and, and we've discussed this uh, before. Oh, well, yeah, look at that. <laughs> another, another force that, that I think uh, we need to keep an eye on for 2021 is... Uh, the supply demand of silver. I mean, silver, of course, it's, it's, the price is obviously set primarily by, you know, by monetary policy, that, that's, that's very clear. It trades, um, you know, in response mostly to the, to, the U, to, to the US economy, to the US dollar. Um, but I think we are moving into a territory where, you know, I, I follow the silver market very closely. And I'm, it really strikes me, you know, and uh, the amount of trading of silver that happens at the paper level on the SLV. Then if you start taking into account the amount of silver that India bought in 2019, and I think this year is going to be something similar. It's equivalent to world production for, for a full year. Uh, China is on track to have a record year of buying silver. Industrial usage of silver is increasing for solar panels, for um, um, 
you know, to use in, in certain, uh, you know, the, in the healthcare industry. It's uh, increasing also, you know, the uh, electric vehicles, as you know, uh, consume more silver. So, uh, I mean, again, like, you know, where is all the silver really coming from? <laughs> because, you know, by, by my, can like by a simple count, anybody can see that, you know, there's three times more, uh, the world production of silver that's been claimed to be, uh, you know, being bought every, uh, every year. And, and, you know, you, you, many of you might remember well that in 2010, 2011, 2012, um, you know, in addition to, to what, you know, what that at the time seemed like unprecedented money printing, you know, 800 billion, which, you know, <laughs> by today's standards, it's nothing. And, and then, uh, you know, th there was rumors of a uh, shortage of, of silver supply. And then, you know, that sent the silver prices close to, um, you know, I think $45 at the time. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I do think that we're starting to get very close to the, po to the point where, you know, that scenario could play out. So I think those are the two things to, to watch for. I, I do expect that there will be a fair bit of volatility, but I'm... Um, you know, personally very convinced about silver uh, moving upwards for, not just for, for 2021, but I think for the next little bit. Yeah, I certainly think so. It's gonna be fascinating to see how it unfolds. And it was interesting, you mentioned, where is the silver gonna come from? Jorge, you're one of the people that the world is going to be counting on. You're running Reign of Silver. Uh, real quick, can you just let folks know where they can find you, how they can stay posted? Um, Absolutely. That's a great question, and you are one of the answers. Yeah. Yeah, well, so, so our, our company is listed in the Toronto Stock Exchange under RSLG, on the Venture Exchange. And then we're also listed on the OTC recently under RSNVF. And, um, you know, if you want to reach out to, uh, to me directly, you can write to me either at ir at reynasilver.com or info at reynasilver.com that actually forwards to, to my email. You can also write to me directly at uh, j-o-r-g-e at reynasilver.com. I think last time, uh, Chris, I had mentioned to your readers that, um, you know, the, there's a great book written about, um, about one of our projects uh, called Batopilas. It's called the, the Silver Magnet. I, I have it right here. And it's a, it's a, I don't know if you had a chance to read it already, Chris, I think I sent you a copy, but it's a, it's a really well written about one of our, uh, one of our projects called Batopilas. And if any of your readers is interested in the book, I would be very happy uh, to send it to you. Um, and then in terms of, of what to watch for a company, we just announced a, a couple of weeks ago that we received our permits to drill our Gigi project. Watch out for a press release that will be coming soon where, when we will be giving the exact time of uh, when we'll start drilling, but it, it's very, very soon. So very excited to, to start drilling uh, the Gigi project. You know, it, it's a district that produced half a billion ounces of silver where the average grade of the silver was 310 grams per ton silver with about 15% lead zinc combined. I mean, a tremendously high metal uh, value and you know we're in the in the search for for the missing uh, part of the of the district, so you know the that's uh, the main things to to watch for. Well, I appreciate that. And again, at the bottom of the Rainy Silver homepage, you can sign up. That's where I get my news. Nice to have it delivered. Uh, so thanks for joining me, Jorge. I see you got your copy of the Big Silver Short. In the yeah, back. It is, it's 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 a great book. You did it. You did a good good job, Chris. I, I you know I've been reading. Uh, 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 quite a few books about silver this year, and I have to say, yours was uh, was it's a very good good read, uh, very well written. So, uh, yeah, I also highly recommend it to to everyone. Well, I'm honored to be on your shelf. <laughs> Again, uh, give a quick update what you're seeing and uh, uh, wrapping up the year year end progress of Reina. So, thank you, Jorge, and we'll look forward to checking in with you again soon in 2021. Thank you, Chris. And, and, and in case I don't get to, to see you, have a, a great uh, holidays. All right. Thank you, Jorge. I appreciate that. We do have some other mining stock news to cover on the show tonight. A few companies we've looked at and had on before. 
here is Blue Lagoon Resources run by Rana Beg. I believe that was back in September we had him on. And just a recap, I have a couple notes here of some highlights that I thought were significant. They asked us to do an update and uh, I have a few notes here and we'll go through some of their recent news, which I think shows that they're following up on what they're doing, uh, which is always nice to see the progress. And that's one of the things that, especially with the newsletter writers, uh, different analysts I've talked to as I've been learning the mining stock side of this. Um, and that's one of the things that a lot of folks like Brent Cook and others look for just, do they follow through with the plans? Um, so anyway, you have basically the Dome Gold Mountain site. And one of the advantages is that 68 million was already invested by the previous operators. And as Rana mentioned in his interview though, they were more focused on mining and trying to get dividends, not exploration. So essentially what Rana is hoping to do is basically take advantage of the 90% of the project that is unexplored and hoping to find the true upside in there. Although even with, without that, they are nearing production. They begin drilling January 11th, 2021. And right now they are 1.5 million in CapEx and three amendments away from getting to production in six to 12 months, which means that theoretically uh, everything falls into place could be in production by the summer of 2021, which would certainly be interesting timing, especially given the gold environment, even with gold about 200 bucks off of the highs, still quite a healthy margin. So it's nice that you have the margin if they go into production and then the upside of the exploration. And again, I think that's really what they're focusing on is hoping to find more as they continue to drill as you can see under the latest news here, a couple of uh, recent drill results, which we can take a look at here back on October 21st, um, hitting 34.5 grams per ton gold over 1.53 meters, 41.86 grams per ton gold over 1.32 meters, and 15.02 over 1.71 meters down a little further. You can see this was designed uh, as a focus on upgrading a significant portion of the inferred mineral resources to indicated. Uh, that was October 21st here on November 10th. Some more uh, results. Blue Lagoon hitting 25.92 grams per ton gold and 169.46 grams per ton silver. Nice to see they have silver in there over 4.52 meters and then even more recently on november 18th uh blue lagoon stakes new prospective ground at dome mountain after careful analysis um company has significantly expanded this land package uh by nearly doubling its previous land position to 18,934 hectares and I guess a few other notes I had here to include. Shareholders include Peter Brown of Canaccord. And also one of the things that I liked about Rana and one of the things that I really look for, I mean, I, there's, yes, you wanna make sure that the actual metal is there and there is value in the numbers, but maybe I'm a little biased because after, uh, in the last decade, been focused around the entrepreneurial process and learning different ways of looking at things and seeing how important it is the way the person running the business handles the things they're doing. Um, and it was interesting because Rana is not coming from the perspective of multi-decade gold or silver bug, but had the experience of running a couple successful companies before, knows how to sell a product, knows how to sell an idea, knows how to raise money. Um, and one of the things I loved about what he said, he, he really emphasized how he tries to make sure everybody else in the room is smarter than him, not trying to be the smartest guy around and show everybody how impressive he is, but rather getting smart people. And these are the things that strike me as, again, I've never run a gold or silver company. So essentially the way I look at it is that, all right, I want to hire someone to manage my assets from converting dollars into shares and whoever's running it, do they know how to 
get the message the geologists are finding to the public? Do they know, hey, when this didn't go well, how do we regroup and make a new plan from here? So those are the kind of things that I look for and I like the way Rana was going about doing things. So anyway, that is Blue Lagoon Resources. Uh, hopefully we'll have a follow up from him soon, but just wanted to provide that update. And uh, with their share price down slightly along with gold prices, if you're looking for leverage on a pullback, then it is one to do further due diligence and I will have the interview with Rana at the end of this clip so you can see for yourself. But thank you, Blue Lagoon, for bringing us tonight's episode. Sure do appreciate that. And in closing tonight, two last quick notes here. Uh, we have Bay Horse mobilizes, that's Bay Horse Silver, mobilizes diamond drill to Harrison High Grade Gold Project. Uh, I've talked with Graham O'Neill, who runs Bay Horse Silver. Um, it's a little bit smaller, so some of you may not be as familiar, but just wanted to pass this along. I enjoyed meeting Graham and um, just wanted to let you guys know in case anybody out there has not heard of Bay Horse Silver. Not a ton of silver stocks out there. So anyway, I uh, believe we may have Graham on in 2021. Find out a little bit more about that one. Although in closing, a stock that I know you are well familiar with. Keith Newmeyer was on the show last week, uh, shortly before this announcement of an inaugural dividend. Uh, the company intends to pay quarterly dividends of 1% of the company's net revenues commencing after the completion of the first quarter. And here Keith says, the announcement of our inaugural dividend policy is a major milestone for the company and validates the overall strength and sustainability of the business given our robust operations in Mexico. Um, new quarterly dividend also gives shareholders even greater leverage to silver prices as it's tied to revenues of the company. So I think that's some pretty exciting news. And again, another one of our favorite, my favorite company builders. I won't speak for everybody out there, but anyway, that is today's silver news. Thank you for being here. Hope you're having a great night out there and someone's getting you lots of gold, silver and mining shares for Christmas. And again, to find out a bit more about Blue Lagoon Resources, well, that interview is coming your way now.